My name is Ted Hodges. Today I will introduce, interview Dr. Philip Hostetter, a veteran of World War II. This interview is a part of the Veterans Oral History Project. The interview is being conducted in the Riley County Office Building located at 115 North 4th Street in Manhattan, Kansas. The camera operator for the recording is Dana Dotteridge. Today's date is September the 2nd, 2003. Dr. Hostetter, to get us uh, started on the interview, could you tell us your full name, your rank, and your serial number? Just like in the service. Just like in the service. <laughs> Philip Harvey Hostetter, MD. My number was 0469688. I was a captain in the Medical Corps of the Army. Do you remember, remember December the 7th, what you were doing when you heard the news? And... I remember it very well. I heard the, heard the, radio, oh, the news on the radio, and the next morning there was a, the Kansas City Star had a special edition out. Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, and I knew we were in for the war. Did you have an idea at that time how it might influence your life? Well, I was a student. I was a fourth year medical student at the time, and I had no plans for the future except the military. None of us did. I didn't even need to worry about what kind of clothes I was going to wear because I figured that would be a outline for me, and indeed it was. Could you start back where you were born and tell us something about your life as you grew up before military service and fill in as many uh, details as you would like? Well, I was born in Albert, Kansas. That's a little town in western Kansas in 1917. My parents were teachers. And um, they... Uh, they, uh, my parents uh, became missionaries to the Potawatomis as uh, Methodist ministers, and they did that for about seven years. And then I went to high school in Holton, Kansas, graduated in 1934, and immediately went to the University of Kansas in Lawrence. Did you... Uh study pre-med as an undergraduate student knowing you were going to be a medical doctor? Well, yes, that's yeah. what pre-med is all about. Of course, you can change, but I had no doubt in my mind uh, since I was eight years old, actually. It's hard to imagine that I would have had my, man, uh, my mind was made up when I was eight, but it was. When I was in the seventh grade, I went to see our family dentist to see what courses in Holton I should take in my pre-medic career, and he said they didn't have much choice there, but he said to take all the science and, and math that they offered, which I did. And when I graduated, the next day I went over to Lawrence and in the, uh, entered in the summer school and went there from um, until I graduated in 1942 with a degree of MD. From a KU med school? Yes, yes, yes. At that time, the first part of the medical program, the first three semesters were in Lawrence, and then we went over to Kansas City at the KU Medical Center. It's the same location that it is today. Did you have uh, brothers or sisters? Yes, I have two brothers. They were both ensigns in the in the Navy. There's my brother Bob. He uh, was on a PT boat in the South Pacific, and my brother Clyde. Uh, he was also an ensign. He was in the Aleutians, on what is called an oiler. That's a floating filling station. He said it was a miserable place to be. And uh, I, I thought the choppies wasn't bad if you could live like a human, which we did occasionally. Then uh, you were about ready to finish med school when 
December the 7th came. Yes, I was in my senior year, my last year. Then you went ahead and finished that and then went into the service? Yes, I did, but I was given deferred active duty for a year for an internship in Wichita. Then I went to Carlisle Barracks in Pennsylvania, officer's training school. In Carlisle, there were 500 in my class. All of them were professional people. Most of them were physicians. And uh, I thought that uh, the time spent at Carlisle was uh, useful because it oriented us to the service and made us feel more at home when we um, associated with infantry officers because we knew something about how to direct a short order drill and the customs of the service. But they told us nothing at all about medicine in the tropics. I don't think any of them knew anything about medicine in the tropics. They were pretty much uh, World War II and um, oriented that way. And uh, so uh, we didn't get much training of of any uh, immediate value in the South Pacific where I was sent. Uh, so I, then, yes, well, uh, so I, I served in the um, in New Guinea to start with. And we went to Melody Bay for 28 days from California. Went to Melody Bay, which was a staging area. Then we went from uh, Milne Bay to Goodenough Island. I was in a collecting company at the time. And then when we went to Hollandia in New Guinea, which was our first combat area, although we didn't see very much combat actually there. We, uh, we, we, uh, uh, well, I was put on detached service with some hospital units there, and I served with them for a couple of months. I was, they knew that I had worked in mental hospitals in my undergraduate years, and so I was just obviously a, a psychiatrist, which, uh, of course, I was not a psychiatrist, but I had considerable feeling for the subject and always been an interest of mine. And uh, I learned quite a little bit about um, psychiatric problems in the service. Should I tell about that? Go right ahead. Well, all right, I found that there are two kinds of emotional casualties that you find in the service. And one of them we call battle fatigue. It is the result of anxiety Sleep, uh, sleep deprivation, and um, and, and just uh, plain tiredness, and perhaps some very har harrowing circumstances. So they were uh, sent to the hospital. They were so nervous that they couldn't sleep. They couldn't eat, their stomachs wouldn't work. I had one fellow, a, a patient, who was a sleepwalker. And in a battle area, although there wasn't any battle going on, there were probably some stragglers who would have, who could have attacked the hospital. And it was just very poorly defended if they had. So I, I was with them a few weeks, and then I was sent to another hospital, which had no psychiatrist. That one had one, and I, I served there for several uh, for several weeks. I was going to tell you about the other type of psychiatric patient that you find in the army. There's the battle fatigue, the fellows who break down under extreme stress and they recover in about two weeks. And the other kind is the type of personality that never did amount to anything, and he, he was, they were maladjusted in civilian life, and they were maladjusted in the 
uh, they, in the military life even worse. And they were certainly unfit for service, and I never did recover in the few weeks that I saw them. They probably went home with a medal and a, a pension as a battle casualty. So um, the good soldiers uh, stayed and fought and died. And these misfits shouldn't have never been with, with the with the with the of all things because in the infantry everybody depends on everybody else and these fellows were undependable and extreme but they could have done duty in any other capacity such as quartermaster and transportation whatever but not on the front line the, the first group that you mentioned, the ones that you said recovered in a couple of weeks, yes. then they went back into battle, right? Yes, away. they did. And they, every day they'd ask me, when can I go back? When can I leave? And, and I said, well, you're not ready to go yet. And they'd say, well, they need me. I got to go. And they'd be listening to the radio, and they had a very sketchy amount of information on the radio. But uh, so they wanted to go back, and, and they had a very poor idea of where they had been, even on what islands they had been fighting on. But in about two weeks, they got to eating again, and they could sleep again, and they just couldn't wait to get back, and so I could discharge them. Mm -hmm. And when you discharged them, they just went right back into their units that they had been very in. Very definitely, in prior. and it was a policy of the army to keep the soldier as close to his combat area as possible because the farther they got away, the less inclination they had to go back. And these were all very eager to go back. Uh, I guess I didn't ask you what the time uh, calendar date was, somewhere around that, when you first went and then how long you were there. Uh, well, I let's see. I, I'm my military duty. I got in here. When did I go in? I was. Um, no, I, this 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 thing is a complicated affair. Um, oh well. Well, I, I guess it's not real important that we know the yeah, time. Yeah, date of entry on active duty, 13 July 43. And I left military service uh, with the end of the war on uh, November 30, 1945. Dr. Hossetter, are there any other events during that service time that you would like to tell us about, you you generalized uh, with with the psychiatric patients. Are there well, any other memories that you had? That have? that was really a, ma a minor for a ma minor part. Mm -hmm. I was with this collecting company for no oh, well several months when we got to the Philippine Islands, and after that. I was transferred to the 24th Infantry Division as a battalion surgeon. And I, that is when my real meaningful service began. And I found service with the infantry very rewarding. Uh, as a surgeon, you did surgery on uh, soldiers that had been wounded? Could you, could you sort of just walk us through a day in your life at that time? Well, the term surgeon goes back to the Civil War. Every physician was, was a surgeon, and they did a lot of surgery. But actually, we lost more people in the Civil War due to disease than we did due to enemy action. And, well, so, let's see, where were we? We, um, you, you were going to tell us about your time as a surgeon. Oh, yes. Well, uh, of course, I was n not a surgeon, but I did uh, some, uh, well, first aid work mm -hmm. in the field. My usual day when we were in a combat area would be that I was awakened at dawn 
because here was a soldier with some concern, and he was going out on a patrol, and he had to see me. And this would go on all day long. And it just got to be too much of a burden. So I told my first sergeant that I just could not handle all this and that everybody coming on sick call should see one of the medical soldiers first and find out what his problem was. And then if he required treatment, to follow it through. And I would see everyone, but not necessarily when they walked in. And this was a great, uh, great help to me because I, I could handle them much more quickly. Well, and they were supposed to be doing that. I just had, hadn't been making them do it. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to, but I found out that you can't do this all by yourself. So uh, you, you generally were in a team of do medical doctors then? No, I was with no medical doctors in the infantry. I was the only medical doctor in the 1st Battalion of the 19th Regiment, 24th Division. And so uh, the, the biggest problem in a job like that is the responsibility of deciding who is going to stay on duty and who is not, because nobody could decide that except me, I, just me. And that's a big problem. Occasionally, so it happened several times. Men came to me and they said they were soon going to get out and they knew if they stayed one more day and went on one more patrol, they'd be killed. And they believed this. But I said, oh, you've been through this a lot. You know, you be careful and all that. And I never knew of any of them that ever came to any kind of grief. But they had this premonition and there were some cases, very, very few actually, when they had a premonition of being killed and they were killed. But this was very unusual. Uh, did you have any contact uh, with the Japanese, direct contact with them or? Well, um, I, yes, uh, when, after the peace was declared, we had a stockade and um, there was about 40 Japanese who had surrendered and one medical officer and nobody, none of them could speak English except the medical officer and he spoke very good English. Uh, we had, this stockade was interesting in that it had no door. Nobody was going to escape out of the stockade and be killed by the Filipinos because the Filipinos had a great many reasons to hate them and would have killed them and probably cut off their heads if they'd gotten their hands on them. Mm -hmm. I heard a lot of atrocity stories, and I know some are too. Did you form any opinions about the Japanese as far as their military uh, capability was concerned? Well, it was pretty poor, disorganized. They didn't seem to communicate with each other very well. And they were, although they'd been there for two or three years, they were completely unprepared for our arrival. And that seemed to me, that from a military standpoint, was absolutely inexcusable. Uh, do you recall when the atomic bomb was dropped and how you felt about that? <laughs> yes, indeed, I do. The, we were we had finished our fighting uh, in uh, the island of Mindanao at the time, and uh, we had uh, knew that a truce was uh, about to happen. But we we were still very much prepared in case somebody had decided to make an attack on us. And um, so we were living comfortably in tents, but, but under complete blackout conditions and, and silence because we didn't want anybody to attack us at night. We got a little bulletin from the Army. It said that an unusual atomic bomb had been dropped 
equivalent to two and then a string of zeros, tons of TNT. And I was supposed to be an authority on everything scientific. And so the, one of the, the officers came around and they said, well, what is an atomic bomb? And uh, I said, well, I've heard there's a lot of energy in atoms, if you can get it out. And they said, well, why so big? And I, say, I said, I think the printer just got carried away when he was writing zeros. <laughs> but it was so. And now, the um, 24th Division would have been the first division to land in Japan in Shikoku Island. And that's where they did land when peace was declared. Well, we had a meeting of officers, and uh, they told us, they figured that if these fanatics in Japan fought to the last civilian, which they intended to do, it would have cost them 10 million people, and it would have cost us 1 million soldiers, and that we would have been the first one there in Matsuyama, that's in Shikoku in southern Japan. Philippines, uh, southern Japan. In uh, traveling there as you were getting your first overseas assignment and then in traveling back, did you do this by ship? Yes, we did. It was a 28-day trip. The ship zigzagged. It was the last voyage of that ship until it was going to be remodeled for, uh, further. And well, I was a boarding party, and so I went to one of the first class cabins, and I chose a lower bunk, and it had an electric fan and an air tube, and was really luxurious. And uh, so I thought, well, since I'm here first, this will be mine. And somebody had to be there, you know. Thought, well, this is pretty good accommodations. I got big. It was a big cabin. It was a, almost as big as this room and um, had a, a separate bath. Gosh. Well, when the evening came, other officers started arriving. They all had their own camp or their own uh, bed folded up. And when they opened their cots, there wasn't a square foot of space left on the floor. I had at least 10 companions in my class A. Uh, but you can't take, uh, well, we, we, they were, we weren't going to sleep two in a bed, so I had my bed all to myself. I thought that was a really, a really a good, a good thing for me. The trip over it was delightful. The weather was nice. And, we, we went south of um, Hawaii, but out of sight of land at all times. And when we got close to the equator, the um, front of the ship would throw up a wave, and at night there would be little creatures sparkling in this that were fluorescent. Um, it, was, it was a really uh, an interesting and very pleasant trip. Now, I had what had been a first cabin with my companions, who were all fine fellows. But the hold of the ship had um, hammocks, I think it was six high, barely enough for a soldier to slide into. And it was hot, and it, it, it was congested. They had to eat in shifts. I never heard a word of complaint. And I say that because um, the soldiers knew what they were doing. Their morale was very high. They never complained. Their sleeping quarters were so unpleasant that much of the time they would sleep on deck. And iron is pretty hard, but it was better than the combination they had. What was this? There the, were 10,000 altogether on the ship. 
And there was just a single ship going along. It wasn't a convoy? No, it was by itself, but it was faster than any submarine. And it could it would zigzag back and forth. And of course, I made a much longer trip for it. Mm -hmm. But um, we never saw any submarine. If they'd been out there waiting for us, why, we would have probably missed them anyhow, and so they didn't try. Mm -hmm. And it was just, just because of its speed. It was speed was about 20 miles an hour. That's very fast for a ship. I don't want to pass over anything from the military in, in the South Pacific. Uh, anything else you would like to tell us, but we might start moving back to the United States then. All right. Uh, tell us about your trip coming back, when that occurred and so on. Uh, well, uh, I, I was uh, stationed in Japan for about two months after the peace was declared. And uh, then I was um, separated from the service, and I waited transportation in, in Nagoya, and then a week in Tokyo. And in Tokyo, we were using an eight-story office building. Now, there was lots of Tokyo that was not destroyed. They think it was all wiped out, but it wasn't. And this office building was intact, and the park across the street from it and the and the the um, emperor's palace, they were all intact, and so uh, I was on the in this off in this building waiting transportation, and the only duty I had was to look at a blackboard each morning and see if it was my time to travel. I went by air on the return. So I was in Tokyo for a week, and it was really nice. The uh, the um, they had a, a young lady running the elevators, and she didn't speak any English, so she had uh, written on the on the wall of the elevator the different names of the of the the floors, and they're right up, and you'd say you know floor three. She'd look it up. Uh, ichi ni san. That would be san. san. And, uh, and then she'd take us to it. She's a cute little gal. Uh, but when we first got to Japan, do we go into that? Well, when we first got to Japan, the uh, 24th Division and landed armed to the teeth because we didn't know what to expect. And a Japanese officer had told us before we left that he was afraid that there would be fanatics out to kill young officers. And this was very interesting because I was 27. But this never happened that I know of. I never knew of any anything of, of anything like that in Japan. The people in Japan were extremely glad to see us and very courteous and helpful. The war was over, thank goodness, and we were as happy about that as they were, and they respected us as superior soldiers, which we obviously were. Mm -hmm. And we had new uniforms, woolen, which when we had those fitted, in the Philippines, we practically died from the heat. But when we got to Japan, they were very comfortable and the best looking uniforms that any army ever had, I suspect. Mm -hmm. So we were very happy. And they, um, we, the, the first day we went ashore, armed to the teeth, we didn't see any people. But we saw the houses, and they were a little like doll houses, really small dimensions, about two thirds what you'd expect, because the people are about two thirds what we were at that time. Well, we didn't see anybody. The second day ashore, we would drive up and down just to see the sights, and we could see people in the distance, but when we got near, they would hide. The third day, we quit carrying arms. 
and the people were out to greet us. And here were the little kids along the road. They had postcards to sell. They'd say, chocolate, chewing gummo. <laughs> they were trading because we had some delicacies, which I bet they had never even hardly tasted in their lives, their short lives. So uh, the war was over. We knew that if, if the adults were plotting against us, the children would have known that and they would have kept their distance. But they were friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, as a medical uh, officer at that time, were you still responsible somewhat for the health uh, of the other troops who were there occupying Japan? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I was. I was regimental surgeon by that time. Okay. And uh, we did have an aid station, which was in a bomb shelter. And um, we had regular visitors every day. There was, we didn't have any illness, though. It was, we, the troops were in very good health. And the, um, we had no, I saw no venereal disease. You, there, that's a problem in any army. And after the fighting soldiers were gone and they had these green recruits, that was a problem, but not with us. If you got a VD, you didn't go home till it was cured, and that, that, that really told them what to do. Of course, I had a tray of dozens of condoms, and if anybody was going to town, why, he was expected, if he expected to have any action, he was expected to take a condom and have a prophylactic treatment when he returned, and they did it. My aid station carried it out, mm -hmm. and we had no VD what, during the short time I was there. Uh, in li <coughs> the living conditions there, you, I think you said you were living in a hotel? Did yes, an office. Yes, I went to this ho hotel. Uh, uh, was this... Uh, serviced by the Japanese? Did the oh, cooks yes. and the people like that, all the services were, were provided by the They Japanese. didn't provide meals. We had our meals with the Army. But uh, we went out there. It was a matter of public relations, so they could see that we were really not the, uh -huh. what they'd, they never believed anyhow, but the propaganda said we were a bunch of, uh, you know, barbarians, but uh -huh. they didn't, they, they knew that wasn't yeah. so. And so <clears throat> we were placed in this I was placed about it with about a dozen other officers, a few great officers, in this small hotel. And um, the first day that we went to this hotel, the three maids came out, and they bowed to till their foreheads were on the ground, indicating their willingness to serve. And this is not our custom at all. It was embarrassing. They said, get up, get up. We don't do this this way. But I noticed that they were wearing sandals and their feet were blue with cold because it was in late fall. But in two days, they all wore GI socks, about half again as big as their feet because Oriental people have very small feet compared to us. The, the second day, second night I stayed, well, the first night I stayed there, why, they showed me my room. I had a room myself with uh, rice straw matting on the floor, and in the evening the maid would bring in a mat, and I lay down on this mat, and it came about to my knees. <laughs> and it was so short. So she came in. I laid down on it. She couldn't say any English, but she, I laid down on it and came to my knees. So she went and got another one, so I had two mats, like a basketball player. <laughs> and the second day I was there, I had my name written in Japanese characters over the door. And uh, this maid, Teruko was her name. She studied that and studied that. She said, Captain Hostetter. She could read it correctly. It was phonetic, and, and she was no dummy, of course, and she could read it. I still have it. 
<laughs> it was nice to have. Her, she was 28 years old. Her husband had died of, um, I figured he'd probably been a veteran of the war and had been killed in action, but no, he had died of cancer of the stomach. And that was very common in Japan at the time. It was known as the Japanese disease, cancer of the stomach. They don't have it now. There's a lot of speculation as to why they don't. Well, we might get back to the war. That <laughs> they um, uh, we didn't see a lot of action at uh, on the at Hollandia, although we did see some. And uh, I was with the collecting company, and we were walking along a trail through the, through a swamp actually, and here was a dead. Japanese soldier on the on the right on the road we went on and um, kind of a file dispersed because that's the only safe way for ground troops to travel dispersed and one of the aid men he was probably just out of high school he said this is just like in the movies troops moving to the front. And you know, it was. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, were you married at this time? Yes. And how did you uh, uh, stay in contact, uh, communication-wise, with your family? Uh, by um, letter. Mm -hmm. uh, they had V-mail. They would photograph the letter that you wrote on I think 16 millimeter movie type film, and then they would print it when it got to the U.S. And that way they could carry thousands of letters in a very small, small space. Mm -hmm. And the, sometimes we'd get no letters for two weeks, and then we'd get a dozen letters. Mm -hmm. Some men got very few letters, and others got quite a few. I was in Oregon on maneuvers in the desert there, and I got a telegram. It said, mother and father, mother and child doing well. Well, that's interesting. Mother, I knew that she was due. Mother and child doing well. Well, uh, so I went around to tell the different members of my collecting company. I said, well, I, I have a child. They said, well, are you a mother or a father, you know, meeting? was it a boy or a girl? I said, I don't know. <laughs> well, in, a, in two or three days, I got a whole bunch of letters and telegrams. And it's a boy. Jim, he lives in Topeka right now. Uh, and then uh, one of those days, then your name did appear upon the board, and you could come home. I came home. And I put on my suntan uniform that we wore in the tropics. And uh, everybody at the airport was uh, making fun of this. Uh, they were wearing their woolen uniforms. And, but I, here I was in a suntan uniform. They were laughing and joking about that, but our first stop was Guam. That is absolutely the most humid, hot, disagreeable climate that you can imagine because we were by that time acclimated to Japan, which is just about like oh, Hawaii or, well, no, not Hawaii, it's like the southern United States. And so, um, so I, I told them, yes, it, it was a boy. And, uh, and they came out to, it, when I was uh, on, at Camp White in Oregon, they, uh, my wife Helen and Jim came out and stayed in a tourist home for a few weeks while we were staging for wherever we were going to go. And by that time, we knew where we were going to go. It was going to be in the South Pacific. We had thought we were going to North Africa. And it was kind of, we'd been pre really, t in the desert, we'd been really training for the desert in North Africa. But by that time, the soldiers there had got the thing under control, and they sent, decided to send us to the South Pacific, and we did. We went to Milne Bay. 
then then you came back by by air. by air. It took five days. And landed we'd we'd where? stop uh, landed in San Francisco. Uh, we would stop every night. We'd stop and then we'd come on the mm -hmm. next day, and it was five days in all. Were you separated from the service pretty soon after you got back to San Francisco? Uh, yes, I was. I had no active duty in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, where were you separated? Leavenworth. At Leavenworth. Fort Leavenworth. And then after that, uh, could you tell us something about your professional career as a civilian medical doctor? Well, raising I, of your family, all those types of things. Ah, uh, yes. Well, I um, started practice in Baldwin, Kansas. I stayed there two years. Decided that I it's a kind of a small place, and I had not been able to afford a residency, so I went to the uh, Halstead at the Hertzler Clinic, and I was, stayed there two years, and then I came to Manhattan. But I hadn't told you anything about the war. Go ahead and tell us everything <laughs> you would like to. Uh, well, um, the biggest, um, well, when we landed in, um, uh, in the Philippines, General MacArthur said that was a bigger, bigger movement and more people were involved than at Normandy. But he didn't believe in photographers. So you see, no photographs and very sketchy information about it because he didn't believe in correspondence. There were no, world no war correspondence. I never saw one all the time I was overseas. Mm -hmm. And um, no photographers. Pictures I took were the only ones I've seen, and so consequently, it never appears on television because there is just no coverage. And um, MacArthur is peculiar in some ways, although we did respect him. And one of them was no reporters except for those of him of himself. I think one of the most memorable experiences I had was the night before we landed in the Philippines. That was on the island of Leyte. That um, the ships were lying about five miles offshore, which is beyond the range of ordinary weapons, and so they felt safe there. And so the soldiers were just sitting around and uh, the chaplain was having a kind of a meeting, but nobody paid much attention. I guess there was maybe 10 or 15 men were with him. Some of them were playing poker. Some of them were writing letters. And some of them just kind of sat around in a pensive kind of way. And, but we could watch the bombardment from the ship, and that is very spectacular. It's got fireworks beat all to pieces. And we couldn't hear the sound because we were so far away, but it just, it just the whole beach we could see was just boiling from our bombardment. And, they, and that was very, very exciting. They would fire rockets six at a time, and they'd go off with a big swish, and then the, the rocket fire would burn out, and they would continue and hit their target on shore. Well, the next morning, they started going ashore when it started getting light. The bombardment stopped. They started going ashore in these landing barges about, um, I think, about 40 or 50, well, I don't know, really, 30 or 40 men in each landing barge with a Navy man is, um, is driving the boat. And they'd go ashore, and then the come back to the, the barge would come back to its ship, get a new load of soldiers, and bring back the wounded. They had some wounded by that time. How they survived on.
beach, I don't know. But they had some pillboxes made of coconut logs, and they were still intact, but I think most of them had gotten off the beach as fast as they could run. So uh, the ba these uh, Navy men kept going back and forth, and some of them were hit and sunk. Most of them got through all right. Well, my uh, my uh, collecting company wasn't going to shore right, right at first, so I went down in the sick bay of the ship, and it looked just like an emergency room. There were quite a few wounded in the ship there, and uh, these Navy medics were working it quietly and very expertly. And we can be very proud of them. Well, I got in my, I went, I went ashore in a truck about the middle part of the morning. And um, when I, I got ashore, um, steaming ashore in a truck, why the collecting company was on the beach and I didn't know what to do, so I just sat, I sat around there and a couple of soldiers came by and they said uh, they're having a, they're having a celebration down the beach. MacArthur's coming ashore. You know, well, I, I felt I had to stay with my outfit because they might move. And pretty soon they came back. He said, yeah, he got ashore all right. And he got his pants legs wet halfway to the knee. And uh, they weren't making fun of it. It was just to hear all these things going on. And here he, he, he got his pants legs wet. Well, uh, uh, pretty soon uh, uh, civilians were coming by. And we had an aid station set up. And so here comes a young lady who was absolutely the most beautiful sight that I had seen for months. And uh, I thought maybe I'd just been overseas so long, you know, that I was a, a little bit um, uh, <laughs> prejudiced there. But I was, she, she was talking to me, and, I, and her mother had a wound in her forehead, and we put a bandage on that. And I noticed while I was talking to her, the soldiers lined up in a semicircle, too deep, just looking at this beautiful woman. Because that, well, we'd been in New Guinea, and they are jet black, and but they were getting a little lighter as we had been there. And when we got here, here was this beautiful lady. She said uh, that I was the first one she'd talked to. And, and then a Filipino man said, well, she was the beauty queen of the city of Apollo. So I guess we weren't as bad off as we thought. Well, I was going to tell you, when we first came ashore, I uh, came across, or was, saw a man with a broken arm, a broken humerus. I asked him how he got his wound, and he said, well, he was in a bayonet fight with an enemy, and I said, did you get your man? He said, I, I think I did. And kind of proud of himself as a soldier. He wasn't that proud of killing anybody, but he was proud to be a soldier. Also, he was homeward bound. And while I was doing this, why... Take, trying to start some blood plasma for on him, and it wasn't easy. I finally got it started. And then one of the men in my company said, Say, did you know who was just here? General MacArthur was here. He stopped and watched you for quite a while. Well, why didn't you tell me? Well, we had orders to pay no attention to high officers. And they didn't. He... he no attention at all, because there were assassins around, and if they knew it was MacArthur, they would have got him if they could. The next day, um, and, but we thought it was very foolhardy for him to be on the beach because there was machine gun the gun was still firing hardly a hundred yards from us. 
Well, we thought it was foolhardy, but the next day, a soldier, a, a, a Philippine soldier, came down from the mountains and came to, and saw us on the beach. The beach was totally covered for five miles with men and equipment. And he says, I am delighted to see that you are here. But where is General MacArthur? Because they believe in personal diplomacy, personal leadership. They don't have political parties, it's the person. And so I lied a little. I said, well, we, he was here yesterday, and we all saw him. And he smiled. He said, oh, he said, that is so wonderful. That means that you are here to stay. This is not a commando landing. So the general was right. He, by being there, he, he showed himself in six different places in the island of Leyte. I think the, well, we had a tree burst and lost eight men and one well, midnight. And probably the most uh, spectacular thing we did was uh, uh, traveling a hundred miles or more across southern Mindanao. And uh, when we arrived on the, from the from the west coast to the east coast, the Japanese commander there was totally surprised because our radio was saying we were in fur furious combat on the beach and we had no resistance at all on the beach and we all just laughed and laughed. But he believed it, and when we showed up, he was in trouble. <laughs> The uh, time period from your landing on up until uh, General MacArthur came, how, what was that? Was he there pretty soon after your landing? Uh, uh, yes, he was. Uh, I think it was about 10 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so he, it was a good thing for the propaganda or the, because the people, that is what it takes for people like that. Is the same is true in Japan itself. I might tell you about the tree burst we had one night. We were out, and how long do we do this for anyway? Another. How are we coming on time? We have five minutes. Oh, well, people always think that a uh, war is all blood and thunder, and it really it isn't. There's a lot of times that go on where nothing happens and you have a lot of fun, a lot of jokes and things. But this time, north of the city of Davao, my battalion, it's about six to seven hundred men, were in a, a perimeter. The men were dug in all around a circle and the medics and the headquarters were in the middle. Midnight, everything quiet. And all at once, I was sound asleep. All at once, I was awakened. A big shell had gone off in a tree above us. That woke me up. The I, um, dirt was falling all around me. Soldier not 20 feet away had his head blown off. This is very harassing. Then um, they, they brought me... Um, very young soldier. I died. didn't look like he was more than 18. Both hands were blown off. So I fastened belts around his wrists. I was giving him blood plasma. He died in about half an hour. When he did, my first sergeant, he was a man of considerable military experience, he threw up. Well, we, we, and then uh, uh, shortly after that, he said he thought he'd look around. He said he found two more with their heads blown off. It's uh, remarkable. And then uh, I heard um, cutting through the grass behind me and some fire from the periphery, and they brought in a soldier who was shot through the middle by his buddy. His buddy had gotten turned around, and this is easy to do, and he thought that our group was attacking the enemy, and he fired at his buddy and killed him. We had eight 
the next morning, all dead, all lined out. We, we, I had them move them away as far as they could and still be in the periphery. So, uh, so uh, the chaplain was the last one to awaken. And I said, uh, Chaplain, uh, can you get these men down to Deval? He says, I, I can't do anything. I don't have any men under my command. Well, I said, it's not my job either. It's the quartermaster, actually. I said, the medics are not concerned with the dead. It's poor for morale, and besides, got other things to do. Well, so the, the soldiers organized some litter bearers, and they carried the eight down to the city of Deval. It was a very sad day. Very sad. I noticed, Dr. Hostetter, when you came in, you had oh, uh, yes. some... Uh, Things you might want to show us. Yeah, well, I've written a book. I, I've written a book, so I could go on for days on this because I've already done it. Here's the book I wrote. Doctor, that's me. You, you see, I'm getting better looking all the time. But doctor and soldier in the South Pacific, and the bookstore price is $24. You can write to me if you want one. And all these stories are in here, which makes it easy for me to tell them on and on. But this uh, was this Japanese saber was captured in combat. Uh, lieutenant and his, um, his platoon of about 15 to 20 men went out looking for the enemy. And they came across about 20 of them in a rice field harvesting rice because they were starving. But they made one mistake, no sentry. And that's when I got the saber. <laughs> well, they, um, he came back. He couldn't keep it himself. He, which man in his platoon could he give it to? So he gave it to me. And there was blood on it. I said, how did you get blood on it? He said, well, we were coming back and we found a snake and we killed, killed the snake. But this was a Japanese uh, 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 sergeant, uh, yeah, sergeant major, they told me. It's all metal and that was what they used in the field. It's a badge of honor, actually. I, They'd just kill prisoners with a saber, but they didn't actually fight with it much. Uh, are we through? We can go on some more with another tape. Well, I don't care. See, I've got a whole itchy nose. Excuse me. Go right ahead if you would like. Well, what other anecdote do you like to hear? Um... Oh, yes, I w well, uh, when I was with the hospital duty, why, well, I was visiting uh, a different hospital, and I met a nurse there. And we were sitting out uh, on the ground and under the palm trees. And the wind was blowing gently, and it was everything like you might think about Hawaii. He was very romantic. And um, after visiting a while, why, I told her about my two-year-old son back home, and uh, she, and then she confided to me that she was thinking of marrying one of the doctors in her hospital. And what did I think of the idea? And the very same scene is in South Pacific. A nurse, in this case a lieutenant, in the same uniforms that we were wearing, and she asked him the same question, and he gave the same answer. He, he thought the times were too unsettled. So when I saw the play, I was amazed and said, "I've been, I've been there." The our relation with nurses was always very good, and a lot of the stories you hear may sometimes be true, but are usually not. Then there, 
I always had only the greatest respect, but I very seldom served any nurses, just a, just a few weeks. But I had the greatest respect for them. When they sent me to that hospital, I said, well, they said, well, here are your tents, two tents, 26 men in each tent, but there were no soldiers there, nobody there. And the next day, 26 men came in each tent, and it was utter chaos. And I was trying to interview them, and this is a very lengthy thing in psychiatric cases. And so I tried to get everybody on some kind of medication. I had a pretty good idea about medications at the time. And, and uh, I had a ward boy, and he'd walk up and down. And, and of course, he was not really under my command because I was just visiting there. So I couldn't order him around much. But he, he was up and down. He said, who wants the blue pills? Who wants the yellow pills? And, terrible. And... But this went on for two days, and here comes a nurse. Thank goodness. She was older than the rest of us. I think she was about 35. Very sensible. And she uh, took a paper cup and put the medications for the day in the paper cup, just like they do in hospitals. I had never occurred to me that I could do that. But she did. Now, the men treated her with... Um, very courtly type of respect. And when she was around, they were on their best behavior. So uh, that was an um, ex experience with, uh, with nurses who I admire very much. When we first got to New Guinea, why my collecting company was thrown in with a kind of field hospital. But we weren't doing anything. We were just getting acclimated and so on. And no women. And we'd gotten used to no women over a period of about six months. And we were getting along more or less with in more or less comfort. And then nurses showed up, six of them. Something we hadn't seen for a long time. And this, this required additional adaptation. Women, when you hadn't had any, even seen any for months. And so the only thing we could do was just kind of ignore them. This went on for two days. When the nurses said, this is the most unfriendly outfit I have ever been with. And we saw how silly we were and we started associating with them. <laughs> But uh, that was that was just staging area. Well, let's see what other thing did happen to us. Oh, we we made a shower. Well, and in Mindanao, when we w went from coast to coast, a distance of over a hundred miles, mostly on foot, and did it in a very short time and surprised the Japanese totally. Um, we had uh, casualties. We had 110% casualties. That seems like impossible, but not, because they kept coming back to duty, mm -hmm. and we got replacements. <coughs> <coughs> The, we had um, we had more casualties. A casualty is somebody you have to evacuate to a hospital unit, and so we we had three hundred and forty, three hundred and sixty casualties due to accident and disease, and three hundred and forty casualties due to enemy action. And of these, I never knew for sure, but I think probably about 20 lost their lives. Most of them returned to duty. Have you stayed in contact with any of the people that you served with? Oh, yes. 24th Division. And 
I did not see very many that I had served with. And this is my battle battle helmet here. <laughs> and this this my most prized reach. Can you see this? This is my most prized award, is a combat medic badge. And I have noticed in generals that I have met with their many wards, the one at the top of it is a combat infantry badge, which is, corresponds to this medical badge. And I also have a bronze star, and that was a interesting day, I'll tell you. Tell us about that, please. Uh, well, uh, we was out in the wilds, um, not far from the city of Deval, but really out, way out in the country. And we were walking along the uh, road uh, in uh, file, file on both sides and um, going out to out in the out in, farther into the country we paused to rest and i heard a small explosion and and uh, i turned on my radio now our radios were so heavy that w it's all that one man could do to carry one of them and somebody else had to carry his pack but they did it quite cheerfully and so it came on my radio and it said, send the medic, send the whole medical detachment. <coughs> well, I wasn't going to send the medical detachment, so I sent two men. What was going on, and pretty soon they came back and they said that a mortar, a small mortar, had fallen in a road intersection that we had just walked over. And our regimental commander... Uh, Colonel Clifford was killed and uh, another officer beside him and the regimental uh, surgeon at the time was beside him but he wasn't hit. Mortars don't have an infinite number of section, of, of fragments uh, and uh, it's possible to be close to one and not be hit but these two men were, they were killed. So, but we went on to our dis <coughs> destination and we took a position on top of a hill, and when we got there, why, I said, uh, everybody started digging in. If you can dig in even a foot down, you're pretty safe against rifle fire, at least. And so everybody was digging in, and um, but my first sergeant, and... Uh, I said, how come you're not digging in? He said, well, um, I've been through a hundred of these. Hey, what's the difference? Well, I had a enlisted man who wasn't digging in, and I had a few words with him, and he got busy right now. But not the first sergeant. And he didn't dig in. But he got through the night all right, as he had done many times before. And so we were sitting on our hill, and we heard the that uh, Company B was under fire. And uh, so uh, we th we'd go down and thought we'd go down and help them. So I told my radio man to stay on the radio and keep in touch and, and, and when he could come down and join the rest of us. So I went down there. And as I approached, why there was a stream of wounded coming back. <clears throat> well, um, at least two of them had wounds in their chest, and every breath they would take, air would suck into their chest, and that collapses the lung. And this could actually kill you in a very short time. But I carried some suture, and I just made a purse string uh, suture right around the entrance wound, and of course this closed it from the air sucking in. You can't put 
a bandage on a wet skin and get it to stick. And there is no way you can do it except just tie it shut, which is what I did, and I got no complaints out of anybody, of course. Well, I put my carbine against the tree, <coughs> and uh, and I was uh, seeing these wounds as, as they went by. <coughs> And pretty soon here was my first sergeant. He said, oh, Captain, I'm sorry. They got me. And indeed, he, they had. He died that night. He was shot through the liver. Well, that's when I got a bronze star. And that, that was signed and written and signed by some enlisted men, and I don't never heard of any case of that happening before. They rejected it the first time because I wasn't supposed to be armed. I, I, I recommended a couple of aid men because of the experience they had, and same thing. They said they're not supposed to be armed. Well, we all carried carbines. And we didn't have to use them, though. Yes, we're done. Like oh, not just yet. Okay. No. Later on. He he just heard you coughing, I believe. Oh, Go right ahead. well, I'm, I, that's something I have. It's kind of an allergy, I think. This uh, is the re 19th Regiment insignia. It comes from the Civil War. The um, the regimental surgeon of the 19th Regiment in the Civil War came to practice in Manhattan. And I had the same job, also practicing in Manhattan. I thought that was quite a coincidence, Dr. Little. It is a coincidence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I could go on with, with stories. In fact, I have a whole book of them. I think we have uh, what, ten more minutes that we could go if you would like to go ahead. Well, uh, we had our fun and we had our, of course, sadness. But it, it's not a, such a dreary life. It, it was an adventure, and it, when we weren't actually in getting shot at, why well, it, it wasn't bad at all. I got so I could sleep on the ground in a trench that I dug myself with my head in my helmet. I would feel perfectly comfortable. I'd get up in the morning feeling fine, and I, I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> but I, I could do it then, no problem. When we were traveling across Mindanao, they gave us rations every few days when the trucks could catch up with us. 4,000 calories, and um, I ate everything they gave me, and I was losing weight. Now, that's a football player's right. diet, but there were some men who didn't like certain things, pampered boys that they were. They didn't like it, so they would discard their rations. And if I had been a little more mature, I would have talked to all the company commanders, all four of them, and said, we don't do that. We might not ever be resupplied, and besides, you need 4,000 calories. They wouldn't be hungry because they were so nervous. Mm -hmm. Not me. I ate everything. I wasn't nervous. <laughs> People ask me, was I ever really frightened? Well, I never really was. But when um, I never interfered with anything I was trying to do anyway, I could start I could start, uh, fluids in the vein and things. Uh, the the serious wounds we didn't treat in the battle, in the in out in the, in the on the field, we would um, the thing to do is to wash them with soap and water, no alcohol or anything like that, and uh, then <clears throat> put some sulfonilamide in a in the wound and not try to do anything more because you'll only make it worse, and get them evacuated. It's not a we could get them back in only a few few hours. They would usually, they were no ambulances. They could never make the roads. But they would return 
the casualties would return in the truck that brought the rations with an escort of our men, which they could sure use overseas right now. And I don't never heard of any uh, of these uh, ration trucks being attacked, but they certainly could have been. So my casualties would go back in the truck. We, um, we did use jeeps somewhat. We could carry two layers on a jeep. How far back were they going? Uh, you said they could go back. Oh, anywhere from about two to five miles. <clears throat> now, in Vietnam, they um, used helicopters for carrying their wounded. And I asked one of the officers at Fort Riley, how long would it take our forces to shoot down a helicopter? He said, one shot. So they would still be carrying them on foot, and they would still be in ambulances and jeeps. They wouldn't be helicopters, not in the area where the firing was going on, because one shot of our modern army will take them down. Of course, these right now, they, it's not a modern army, and they are not successful at them, except a time or two. Oh, well, anything else of interest, I wonder? I guess I've gone and rambled around, and had the nurses, and I was in, I had dengue. That is a thing that feels like flu for two or three days, and then you feel good for a day, and then the same thing comes back again. You've heard about it, carried by mosquitoes. They sent me to a collecting company. I was feeling miserable. Every joint ached for two days, and then I felt fine. And uh, my um, nurse, who was a man, came in, and my second attack, he came in. I said, he said, uh, sir, are you going to breakfast? He looked at me, he said, no, I guess not. <laughs> it was a miserable thing. But I was over it before long. That was one of my, and then the, the second illness I had was uh, hepatitis. Everybody had hepatitis. Uh, I was going along in my Jeep one time and I saw a man yellow as a pumpkin <coughs> with hepatitis. And uh, they really had no, no good cure for it. So I went, I stopped and I went in. I said, how do you feel? He said, I feel all right. Yellow as a pumpkin. Well, they couldn't do any better for him in a clearing company or a collecting company. And, or a hospital, stay on duty. But I got it myself. And I knew I was going to because I was traveling in my Jeep. I had a driver in those days. I was driving along in every little ounce, and there were lots of them. Well, my liver was sore, and I could feel it. Well, I knew I was in for it. Next morning, I was lying in my bunk my cot, which was dug down so as to be down lower. And I, I didn't get up when I was expected to, and battalion commander came along, uh, Major Joy, and he says, Doc, you're going to the hospital. And that wasn't his place, you see. That was my place. But in this case, there was only one medical officer, and that was me, and he wasn't in any condition. So he sent me off. And I was there about uh, 10 days or so, and I recovered. Most of them did. My, you've had lots of experiences. Uh, let you, me ought ask you, you ought to read this book sometime. I'd like to. Let me ask you one final question here. Were you able to use the GI Bill in any way when you got back home? No, and my medical class was the last one that was not subsidized. Mm -hmm. From that on, from then on, they were all subsidized. They were members of the armed forces, but they were in, in medical school. They went to summer session, and it took them three years instead of four. 
the, um, the, the, many of them had a nine months internship, and I had 12 in Wichita. And believe me, with half the doctors and twice the population, interns were practicing medicine from the very first. And it was a good thing, too, because I was practicing practically by myself from then on when I got in the Army, at least when I got when I got in the, in the, with the, uh, with the infantry. I was not infantry, of course. I was a detached service. Uh, but I, but I was certainly with it and I was under their command. And incidentally, I never had any conflict with any infant, I infantry officer. They would sometimes call me Doc and I said, now that is a company aid man and that is not my name. You can call me Hostager, Phil, Captain, but not Doc. That's an aid man. And they hadn't thought of that. And so from then on, they showed me some respect, not that we cared much. But it was just part of being the, the, the comradeship of being in the Army. Well, we, we thank you. You really have a lot of history to share with us. <laughs> well, we appreciate it very much. It was, a, it was an experience, believe me. Anybody want to shoot anybody's head with this saber? <laughs> anyway, you, you really yeah, have yeah, to. That's an hour and a half. That's